obviously we don't have a specific microphone, but if somebody does have something that they'd like to say, um, and I think we're going to talk, and then we're going to break into smaller groups and just commiserate about what's going on. Thanks, Bruce. Hey, everyone. I'm uh, Bruce Harlow. Um I first met Steve at DunderCon 2 or 3 when I was a lad of 15. I remember sitting down to play some board game with him. I'll be darned if I can remember which one. Um, and uh, Steve looking at me and said, have I seen you at an SCA tournament? And we had to start to get into the SCA, um, me and a bunch of my gaming friends from high school. And that made Steve accept me as a peer. And we had a great time playing a game. I played a role playing game um, with him after that. And it was always a delight to see him um, at every Denver con. He really was an inspiration to me. I'm a professional game designer these days and I have been pretty much all my professional life. I attribute a lot of that to Steve, to the parent conventions, and to him letting me know that such a thing was possible, that you could be um, a game designer uh, which, you know, back in the 70s, <laughs> that really wasn't a thing, even in the 80s, um, so much. Um, my favorite gaming memory uh, with Steve was in a George McDonald's champion campaign, um, where I was playing my character, the Marksman, and as a side note, um, Steve wrote a comic book based off of my Marksman character for Heroic Publishing, which later became The Huntsman. Um, so I, that's kind of how much I trusted Steve for him to take my beloved character and uh, be able to do something with it. But uh, we were fighting in the skyscraper, um, fighting against Eurostar, and Marksman's a gadget-based character who uses a rifle. And at that point, I was using the champion system to build everything in the rifle. And uh, I was fighting um, uh, the brick Durak, who managed to grab my rifle and throw it um, out the 50th story window. And then he managed to grab me and throw me out there. Now, I had brilliantly built my character's gliding power um, into the rifle as a focus. So the rifle was gracefully kind of floating down, and Marksman was plummeting down to his death. And Steve's character, which I think was Crusader, um, anyway, ran out the window and jumped after me to um, leap and uh, grab Marksman to stop him from um, falling to his death. and. Uh, it's like, Steve, does Crusader fly? No. So uh, <laughs> there we are both plummeting down to our desk. We managed to get ourselves out of that situation. But that's just, I, I think, epitomizes the kind of man that, that Steve was. You know, um, valiant, brave, um, and willing to rush ahead, um, almost no matter the consequences, um, if he was going to help someone else, let's help someone out. Um, I was very fortunate. Uh, to call Steve a friend. Um, he was someone that I was very, very fond of, uh, and his loss is very hard. Uh, thank you. Thank you. My name is Bill Kies. Uh, besides being on the Denver County Committee, I've known Steve for over 50 years. Um, I met Steve when I went to UC Berkeley. Uh, in the 1970-71 year, I met him sometime during that year first in science fiction fandom at the Elvis Nelson and the Little and Science Fiction Chatter Marching Society, then in the SCA when I went to the March Crown in 71, and then eventually I uh, joined the gaming circle when D Dungeons and Dragons came out um, and became uh, rapidly aware of the fact that there were all sorts of holes in those rules and gaping uh, uh, missing pieces. So I helped Steve put together his parent conventions, um, testing them out, and finally you know, he came up with a, a written list of this is what will make it work. And this led to the Dungeons and Dragons convention, Dundracon, um, where I attended and kind of helped out while I was there. After that, I got drafted to come in as a volunteer the next year. And after that, I got drafted to actually run the volunteers because I'd already been running volunteers for Western Con. So I've been with, with Steve pretty much throughout the history of Dundercon and uh, continued to be a member of his gaming group and a game tester. So when uh, it came time for him to work with Greg Stafford to create RuneQuest, I was one of his first game testers there and proceeded to do my very best to break his system. Uh, he considered me the Mac truck driver of bull testing 
uh, he, I would find small holes in the rules and drive a truck through them to show that this is actually kind of big, you should fix this. Um, so time and again, you know, I would show him that, that there were problems here or there. But he was always, you know, willing to, to uh, say, you know, okay, yeah, I need to fix that. Okay, I need to fix that. And um, it was uh, really fun playing with him until it finally, he and Louise moved south. Uh, Steve was one of the very first people to make the conscious effort to be a professional gamer, to actually make his living in the gaming industry. This is before computer gaming existed. Uh, at that point, there was just board games and this new role-playing games idea. And so he proceeded to make his life uh, being a game designer, tester, author, uh, et cetera, and made it work. Um, he gave up an, a reasonable career uh, to, to do this, and despite everything, he managed to get all the, all the way through. So uh, I've always had a great respect for him and have worked with, with him on many of his projects. Um, in the, the Thundercon, of course, I got a chance to work with him on putting on things for people. Uh, both, both, you know, he was the preeminent seminar coordinator, um, and most, most everything else as well. I was volunteers for many times, then wound up moving around and doing different aspects. But the thing that struck me most about Steve was that Steve was always a friend of all. Um, he, he was never conceited or high at movement. He was always happy to meet new people, to bring them into his games. After he moved south, I continued to be in touch with him through Dundragon and play in two or three games each year at the Dundragon convention that he would either host or be in, involved in. So. My hat's off to Steve. I really appreciated having known him. And I um, also, I should point out that Louise also was a major contributor to this. She did most of the illustrations for most of the projects that he worked on, uh, including the book I was able to put out called Room Masters. That's a supplement to RuneQuest because they needed a source of high level characters that people could put in their campaigns. And she did the wonderful illustrations for that. So um, I'm hoping that, that uh, she will appreciate this effort here. And that I wish her well. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else like to speak? My name is Tracy Blackstone. And I moved to San Francisco in the summer of love, 1967. And through an interesting combination of circumstances, stumbled across fandom, which I had no idea existed. I've been reading science fiction since I was 11. But I would have lived in Oregon. And I was completely out of it. I moved here, I discovered fandom, and at the same time, I discovered the SCA which was year two. And my first twelfth night was when Steve and Louise had their wedding. They were, I think, the second society wedding, but the first with an arch of swords. And they were magnificent. I roomed with Louise a while at the Hodgehead's house until she married Steve and moved out. And she was always wonderful to me. She was, is, a gifted costume designer. And she always looked magnificent, and Steve always looked magnificent, because she took just as much care with his clothes as hers. Steve was, to me, the image of the perfect gentleman. He was always kind, always. And he was so smart, but it was hard to tell sometimes because he, he was so diffident. And yet he made things happen. He made things happen. Dundercon is his lasting legacy. It was and is a remarkable 
effort, bringing people together from literally all over the world to mix and match and play together. I was heartbroken when I heard he died, even though I had not been in touch with either of them for a long time. But what what he has made with Duncan Khan is just amazing. And his life with Louise, his wife of more than 50 years, is an inspiration to all of us. What they have is unique. I've spoken some to Louise since he died. And she's holding up okay, but it's like something like the light has gone out of the world. So Steve, be well and remember that you will never be forgotten as long as anybody is a gamer. Thank you. My name is Kenneth Height. Um, I'm a professional game designer, and the reason I am is because Steve Perrin existed. Um, he created basic role playing, which became the engine of Call of Cthulhu, which became literally everything I did in high school and college. And thanks to people that I met running Call of Cthulhu, I got a freelance job at Chaosium, which became a career once I discovered I was no good at anything else. Um, so I'm one of the people that uh, that Steve's life changed without Steve knowing it, and uh, one of the people who knew Steve before they knew Steve. And I started coming out to Dundercon in, in the late 90s, maybe 2000, and uh, it struck me that you know that was Steve Perrin, right, the guy who sort of co-created my existence, just hanging out in a hat. And the thing that amazed me is after the second year I was at Dunker, I think the first year I was just hanging around the Hero Games booth or something, the second year, maybe the Chaosium booth. Um, this, but the second year, Steve knew me and he knew who I was and it was like we'd always been friends. Um, if you've got a friend you've had for 20 or 30 years, you don't have to really catch up, you just sort of resume and for Steve, that was the first moment of the friendship. Because we just resumed, like we'd always been friends. And I remember maybe my third Dundercon, and he said, um, uh, just talking, um, hey, I'm hungry, do you wanna get dinner? Like that was a thing we did all the time. Like I normally went out to dinner with Steve Perrin, which I did not. And of course I said yes, and we had a great dinner, and just like you have with anybody that you, known forever, except I'd only known him forever from his work. And he was always, uh, I, I call him a humble titan, I guess. Uh, he had changed so many people's lives and so much. He co-created an art form, but to him it was just, you know, Tuesday. He never, uh, you know, uh, held himself up in any way. He was always just up here. He was another guy in a Hawaiian shirt. It's probably to blame for my personal style, such as it is. <laughs> and, you know, you can do a lot worse than go through your life thinking, what would Steve Perrin wear? And maybe also <laughs> think, what would Steve Perrin do or write or design? And um, I. I didn't live in the Bay Area, I didn't have the chance to hang around his house or any of the other thing, opportunities that other people had, but the amazing, the great thing about Steve is that it didn't matter. You were just as much his friend if he saw you four days a year as if he saw you 350 days a year. It was an amazing capacity for friendship and generosity, and I appreciated it a great deal when I know him, and I appreciate it even more. And. Uh, Thank you all. Thank you. Hello. 
Excuse me. I first met Steve at a Pacific On right about 35 years ago. And I talked to him for maybe five minutes, you know, because this is Steve freaking Perrin. You know, Perry Conventions, All the World's Monsters, RuneQuest. And he's very nice, just wonderful. For about five minutes. Now it's a year later, and I come to this con. And, you know, I'm seeing all these people that I've read games about and whatnot. And there's a hand on my shoulder. He says, Hi, Doc. Five minutes. And it's like, Hi, how you doing? Well, I'm doing fine. You want to play in a hero game, a champions game? I'm like, Yeah. And Wayne Shaw ran a champions game. And uh, I played Brick. And Steve was some sort of energy guy. We played for about five hours. And it was just like, we did that all the time. And then the next year I started running games here. And every time you come here, it's like he'd known you all your life. And uh, he was never less than wonderful. Uh, like everybody said, completely, no real ego, just a nice guy. Uh, if he, he would send me an email about doing a seminar or whatnot, and uh, then we'd talk back and forth a little bit. You show up at the convention, you know, old times. He was a gentleman. He was an excellent, excellent game designer and writer. And uh, I miss him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know it's hard for people to get up and speak, but I appreciate everybody who has taken that opportunity. Or do we have any more speakers that would like to speak today? Okay. I'm Heather Mace. Um, it's 1983. My, I just got into college at UC Berkeley. Um, I mean, I'd actually played D&D since I was 12. I actually knew what Champions was. I knew what Villains and Vigilantes was. Um, I didn't know who Steve Perrin was. And um, I go to my very first SCA meeting, the Shire of Teufelberg. And my friends and I are like all D&D groupies, and it's like, well, maybe this is some place we'll feel comfortable. And um, Steve Perrin and Steve Henderson, showed up at that Shire meeting trying to recruit playtesters. And it's like, yes, please. And that was, the, I was 18, um, and that was my, the start of my friendship with Steve. I gamed with him every Friday night, and through college, every Friday, Wednesday, and Sunday. Uh, I didn't know that Steve was famous. I didn't know that he'd written all these wonderful games. I just knew him. He was my game master, and it was great. Um, and then we, he, he started the game that will forever be the icon of gaming for me. He helped start Vanguard. Vanguard is a game that ran from 1987 to 2019, I think. Um, and it was a ro it was a rotating pool of game masters. I had the pleasure of um, jamming several games in the campaign myself, along with several other people. It was about a group of heroes, superheroes, UN, right after World War II. Every member state could send a superhero, and they all hated each other. And we all played it like we hated each other. Oh, China versus Japan, oh my god, India versus Pakistan. It was, it was a, we had, we fought each other as much as we fought the bad guys. 
and it was a great campaign. And Steve kept copious notes. After every game, he would write up a summary of what, what had happened, would print it out and distribute it to the group the next game. I still have my binder of notes that he printed out for that game. Um, I ended up getting my degree in computer science. In 1990, um, he was working for Spectrum Holobyte. I was looking for a job. He brought my resume into the in-bid at Spectrum Holobyte. And because of that, I got my first uh, video game industry job. And then four years later, when Spectrum Holobyte did their layoffs, when they merged with Microprose, Steve was working for Maxis. And he dropped my resume into the bin. And um, I got a job at Maxis, working on SimCity. And then I got to work on The Sims. And now I'm a senior software engineer on Minecraft. And I have Steve Perrin to thank for that. He was my mentor. He taught me to love games. And he taught me about persistence. Steve never stopped doing what he loved. No matter how he felt about it, he was, he was always writing, always writing something. He was never not working on something. And he taught me to never give up. So, goodbye, Steve. Thank you, Heather. Say good things about Steve, it's a stampede. <laughs> I get that. Ray Greer, I am now the massage guy at Denver Time, but I wasn't always. We set the Wayback Machine long, long ago, back in 1981. I was with Daryl James. Ray? Yeah. You're going to have to take your mask off. We can't hear you. I'm sorry. So be it. I'll try not to project so hard that the toxins don't spread. But yeah, 1981, I was with Hero Games. And that was an interesting time, because very few people have been doing things out on the West Coast, but a lot of us were trying. A lot of us were trying. And oddly enough, one of the people that was blazing a trail was Chaosium. And oddly enough, somebody in that office was free to share mistakes they would made so we didn't step on the landmines. And that was Steve Perry. We had a good run. We eventually sold the company. Maybe you've heard of these champions, you know. But this guy, along with a few other very important people, gave us the space to learn the craft. And the generosity. We were all in this together. He wasn't. Yes, we we're competitors, but we we're jovial competitors. One to one up one another. But, you know. Giants of the industry that we have lost. But that's not why I'm standing here. Why I'm standing here is because careers change. And I'm the size guy. Well, he's the guy that said, you know, we're all getting a little older here on the staff. Do you have your chair in the back of your car? Because I was here to, you know, play games. So I did that. And now I'm here doing massage on gamers, which was new and shiny and his fault. <laughs> but it meant that I got really tired because it's a physical job. And I missed gaming. And I missed my friends. I mean, with one foot nailed to the floor, they'd all come by. That'd be great. I blame him for that. And I'm really glad he did. But I missed rolling dice. I missed seeing well, it turns out that in his wisdom, he figured out the three key things that were needed to run a game at this show while you were a staffer. And that was find a time in the early evening, get people that really appreciate it, you know, like some of the staff that didn't get a chance to play because they're working for the rest of us, 
and people that don't get a chance to see him, because now he's in Southern California, so you get a chance to play once a year, and then, you know, other folks that would be there. So I got to see all my old friends roll a few dice, laugh a lot, and guarantee that the game would end by midnight, <laughs> so we could all get a decent place. <laughs> Steve had an uncanny knack for understanding the important things in life. God, I'm going to miss that. Ah, farewell, Steve. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Right. Well, I'm Alexander Henderson, son of the Steve Henderson, who's been mentioned a few times here. I didn't know Steve probably as well as most of you guys did because he was just he's my dad's friend. But, you know, it's like, yeah, it's just that guy that you need a thunder to say hi to and have a chance with. But my mom reached out to Paul Mosslander, who was also mentioned, and had him write up a thing. My, I'm not going to take my mask off because my nose is like all the way down to my mouth. But So what Paul said was, I first knew Steve Perrin as a comics fan correspondent. We wrote one another almost 60 years ago, back in the days, as George R. R. Martin reminded me, when we all helped to invent comics fandom. A part of Steve's legacy from that time has been affirmed by current black popular culture scholars as the first Afro-American costume comic hero. Steve created the Black Phantom for his fanzine mask and cape. I think we had a picture of that up in the that's, slides. That's earlier. why I put it there. Yeah with artist Ron Foss. This pioneering mass crime buster and his faithful young white sidekick came two years ahead of Marvel Comics' Black Panther. Although temporarily sidelined by COVID-19, serious interest continues in reviving the Black Phantom, sadly without Steve's participation in writing new adventures. I met Steve and another correspondent comics correspondent Johnny Chambers in the flesh at the 1964 World Science Fiction Convention in Oakland. Soon we three with Clint Bigglestone and Steve Henderson launched ourselves into science fiction fandom through which Steve Parent met his wife, his artist wife Louise. They married at the 12th Night Revel at the Still Young Society for Creative Anachronism. While many of us were well, many of us put aside our creative efforts in order to pursue mundane livelihoods. Steve and Louise gambled on following their talents where they led. While not the most remunerative route, and that commitment afforded them greater artistic fulfillment and opportunities to delight wide communities of shared interest. Steve enjoyed a long and strong influence in gaming as the first co-creator of RuneQuest and then as the writer of other games and characters. He worked professionally at Chaosium and other ventures. He recreationally game mastered, spinning new worlds for his friends to enjoy. Along the way, he penned an interactive novel, Spawn of Dragon Spear, published in 1988 by TSR. He had a foray into writing five issues of an alternative comic. George R. R. Martin credits Steve, Steve's Superworld game with inspiring the entire wild card series of prose superheroes. Throughout the years, he remained a softly spoken, courteous, genuinely nice friend, fan of many imaginative pursuits, and creator who leaves a broad, ongoing legacy. I knew him, mightily approached my friendship. I knew him, I mightily appreciated my friendship with him, and I remain influenced by his life and work. Sincerely, Paul. Any more people would like to speak? So uh, I, I'm going to run something up here. This is something that I never knew about Steve until I did this research, and I was fascinated. All those years ago, and I'm not sure whether it was your father, or who, who it was, was w one of Steve's friends in, in the SCA. Had the association of several Steve's. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he wrote a five lyric birthday song called the Mongolian birthday song. Oh my God. <laughs> he wrote that? Yes. 
He oh wrote god. that. Oh. oh my god. Didn't know he wrote that. And it has now become historic, right? Like the very idea that, yes. that, there, that there is a song that does this. I'm going to play, I hope, a short one that's okay. I have listened to the 40 verse one, and I think it takes nigh on an hour to get oh through God. 40 verses. Yeah, right? not getting right with it as the performance. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see if I can uh, duplicate my screen here and I'll, and I'll play that. But yeah. I did not know Steve was gifted with writing essentially folk music or, or flick music. And, and there are people who have no idea that that was Steve, well, but, but he put it in. If you can't get it running, we'll just sing it ourselves. Exactly. Oh, well, then please, please, absolutely. Yeah. I, mean, uh, <laughs> I don't know all the lyrics. I had really a long time. <laughs> we'll sing along. Yeah, about that yeah, we'll, we'll sing along. I won't even. I won't even put the video up. I'm just going to put the audio. Yeah, just put the audio. Oh, of course. I'm on YouTube. They got to play in half. So I never knew if he did it for Paul Monslander or, or Steve Henderson, but he he wrote that. So yeah, we, we all can thank him and millions of folk singers who have repeated it and nigh, nigh on thousands of YouTube videos. <laughs> I didn't even know, but that's the, like the song that we sung for birthdays in my orchestra class in high school. Yeah, sure, and, and that was the part that's amazing is when I talk to somebody who knows that song, yeah, they had no idea what the origin was, yeah. but and no but, idea it had a name, a title. <laughs> so he he calls it the Mongolian birthday song. Sure. There are many people who call it the Volga birthday song. Yeah. Viking recreationists call it the Viking birthday song, right. and I have a feeling that depending on what your fandom is, it's the birthday song for whatever your fandom is, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but yes. We he, he, on people unawares. He put it on the <laughs> SCA history site. He's got, he's got a number of articles that he's put on the SCA history site. And he recounted the lyrics as best as he could remember them and, and talked about it and the origins and all the rest of this. And, and he said, I don't know how many years I sang it to everybody at the SCA, but it, it, it must have outlasted me. And I, I just found it fascinating that there were all these people who still do it. Wow. And it, it, it. We sort of broke it into the it, the, the more fun part of things. I, I have to say, my favorite part of coming to this thing has always been gaming with other game designers. And gaming with Steve, that was enchanting. Oh, yeah. Like, like it just completely off the chart in terms of where our imaginations went and what happened in those games. and and very few tables that I've been at can compare to one night he says hey it's lonely down in the seminars room and we're gonna have a game and I'm like what what Who, who's game mastering what's going on and he says oh there's no rules or anything he says it's just a guy and he's a really old game designer I know and we're just gonna sit around and we're gonna make up characters mm -hmm. and I, I was like what are we doing, right? And he goes, well, we'll, we'll find out. And so, and so we sat there and he says, you're all between six years old and 10 and you're living in Los Angeles, kids, and you're playing on the street. <laughs> and, and so we went around the table and it was Steve and me and a couple of other people um, James Ernest was there. And like lots of different designers were there. And he just says, introduce yourselves. And so they get to me and I'm like, I, I don't know who I'm gonna be. And so I said, I'm Rocky. 
You know that I'm rocky because my jeans are full, the pockets are full of rocks. And so I got a rock for everything. And, and so that's, that's the character that I played. And we ended up breaking into a Nazi spy's house and like, <laughs> <laughs> and anything that we could get in trouble with. And the, the depth of the characters that were created off the fly with no rules at all. There was no dice, there was nothing else. We just had fun telling stories around you know, game designers. And, and like I said, every time it was, felt like I was being enchanted being in the room with the scene of the game. So, any more fun stories like that? Well, you mentioned the association of several Steves, so <laughs> I believe I have to talk about the formation of that society. And Steve <laughs> Peterson, yep. you know, one of the founders of Hero Games, and I met Steve at an early Dundercon where I met Ray. Uh, at, I think it was Dundercon two or three. I can't remember which one. It was a long time ago. But um, you know, we uh, we had a lot of fun with Steve at conventions and particularly Dundercon. And I think it was a I think it was a Gen Con where I said to him, I was talking with him and Steve Jackson. And I said, you know, we need. There's all these different societies. We need to form our own association of several Steve's because the acronym is perfect. <laughs> and Steve Jackson kind of looks at me and Steve Perrin laughed and said, you know, ever since that time it was, you know, one or the other of us would remind the other, well, you know, we all always are founding members of the association of several Steve's because there's just so many great game designers named Steve, we thought, you know, and, and we inducted Steve Henderson now as, as, a, you know, as a member too. and, and uh, it was just something fun that we did that, that talked about at conventions and, and just had a good laugh and people would look at us strangely. But that's, you know, we're used to people looking at us strangely because we're game designers. Um, it, you know, that's that was Steve though. He always had time for, for fun and, and I think it really delighted him when we figured out after I got married that my wife's father was his father's cousin. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we were related by marriage, and every after, whenever I talked to him, I always called me Cuz. There you go. <laughs> I know Cuz. You know, so, um, you know, but that's that was Steve. He was he was very creative and very generous, but also a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So uh, we could just sit around and chat. I'm gonna turn off the equipment in the recording and, and we can just enjoy ourselves and they're not kicking us out of here anytime soon.